Check, check. We're good? Good evening, everybody. All the sun is still out. How are you? How's everybody? We're good? Good. Um, welcome to church. Um, it's great to be with you guys again. Let's all stand and we'll worship the Lord together. Lord, thank you for bringing us here, God. Um, thank you that we get to come to a place, Lord, where we're reminded of your goodness, of your love, and your grace, Jesus, a place where we can worship with our brothers and sisters, Lord, um, where we can just lift up your name, God, and be reminded that you are God, that you are powerful, God, and we sit and um, rest safely in your hands, God. And Lord, I pray that um, you would just help us to worship you, God, that by your spirit, Lord, you would enable us to um, just take any hindrances away from our brains, from our hearts, Lord, and just to worship you freely, God. We want to exalt your name. You are more than worthy of our worship, Lord. So help us to focus on you, God. We were created for this very reason, to, to worship you through song and through our lives, God. So help us to express that now, God, as we sing to you. Thank you for this time. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is good Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon Mercy for today Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, oh, 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 oh. Father, the Lord, kindness makes us whole, we shoulder our weakness. Your strength becomes our own Now you're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from my ashes You will have your bride Free of all her guilt Rid of all her shame And known by her true name And it's why I see your glory Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Can 
a seat if you'd like, or you can stay standing if you want. Father, above all else, let us help us, Lord, to exalt you, Jesus. And above all else, God, help us to put you first, Lord. 
help us to see all things through the lenses of, of your love, God, of your forgiveness, of your grace, of your word, Lord. Help us to exalt your name, God, with our lives, God. I will exalt you. I will I will exalt you. You are my God. I will exalt you. It's an easy song, sing again. I will exalt you. I will. My safe refuge, my treasure, Lord, you are. You're my friend and king, the anointed one, most holy. Because you're with me. Because you're life you are love you give life you are love 
You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring life. Every heart that is broken. Oh, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we
You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, Master. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I Just what to do I will love you Lord my story I will love you Lord my shield and I will love you Lord my rock forever of my days I God, help us to love you more and more every day, God. We thank you for this time. I ask that you would speak to us and mold our hearts, Lord. Let, let your Holy Spirit just reign freely in this place, God, and just mold us today, Lord. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all stand and greet somebody today. Um, yeah, greet us. All right, well, good to see everyone. Welcome to Sunday evening. It took me, oh boy, almost a year 
to learn to say good afternoon from good morning, and now we got to move it to evening. But I think just for uh, a few weeks. So I think I'm waiting to hear back, I believe, this week from the school district, and um, they said they're, they're going to get back to us July 1st. So we'll see what we do. I should have an announcement for you next week. And kind of with that, too, um, just want to stir that within you guys to be in prayer about uh, ministry or service opportunities. I have a feeling that once we go back to Sunday morning, there's going to be more opportunities to get involved and serve, uh, from ushering to helping with audio, video to the, not now, Scott, to the, uh, <laughs> Scott's always piping, I need help. <laughs> and the, uh, the lyrics, we had Don helping out today, all kinds of stuff. So w w any inkling you have, any desire to serve in any capacity, um, let us know. And actually, too, once we get settled, we'll be hitting outreach more with our address and inviting people to church and reaching to the community. Uh, so be in prayer and preparation for those things as well. And children's ministry, as you can see, that's been growing a lot over the last month or two. We've been having a lot more youth and little ones. So uh, just be in prayer about any way the Lord might want to use you. So next week already is our July 3rd picnic slash outreach. Um, so there's a sign up list on the back for things to bring. We're going to be providing hamburgers and hot dogs. You guys bring all the side dishes. Uh, so the first half of it's going to be outreach. We're going to be just going through the park and inviting people to eat with us and participate, do crafts with us. Uh, and then the second half will be more fun, volleyball, games, and things like that for us at church just to hang out and have a good time. Um, and then July 4th, I know we're still at 6. It's a rough time, July 4th. People want to do their illegal fireworks. None of you, <laughs> I'm sure, right? You guys are all legal. Um, but if... You, I know you guys want to, you know, get out and do family activities. So we'll, we're at a shorter service next week, just six to seven. We're going to do a little bit of worship, devotion, and a prayer time. And so for those of you that are able, please join us. Again, just a time for us to gather and pray. And again, should have announcements. I'll be posting at least an update on what's going on with uh, meeting time. If you miss, if you're married and missed our marriage ministry, we had a really great time on Sunday. So Alan, I'm sorry, Friday. Al and Susie Harv were here. They were very open, very transparent about marriage and their testimony and what the Lord has done and scriptures and biblical principles he used in changing their marriage. Uh, it was very, very, uh, very good, just very encouraging uh, because of their honesty and transparency. So we actually recorded it and we, we want the, everybody to see their transparency. <laughs> um, so we have it recorded on our YouTube channel. So it, we have it up there. The, the sound quality is not great, but you can still make it out. They both share. And again, it's testimony, exhortation, scripture about marriage. It's, I think you'll find it very encouraging and helpful. Um, and then our usual meeting times for prayer. If you need prayer requests, please put them in the box. If you want to join us, I could give you the Zoom credentials to participate with us. A men's study is on Tuesdays in English and Spanish on Thursdays. The English ladies' study just wrapped up, so we're in hiatus, so they're going to be praying about what to cover next. And Spanish, are you guys still meeting? Okay, so Thursday nights, if you, if you want to join the Spanish women's ministry on Thursday as well as the Spanish men's both on Thursday night. And lastly, our hike, um, Josh, for the youth. If any of the youth want to go with Josh tomorrow, he moved it from Angeles Forest, because it's going to be 100 degrees, <laughs> uh, to Malibu. So I might even go, no, uh, to Malibu. So it's going to be 70, should be really pretty. So he's going to take that hike there. So get with Josh after service if you're interested for the youth. Uh, and if you want to accompany your youth, are you cool with, yeah, the parents going along and they're making it a family hike day. So connect with Josh. So we have a, um, an update from Pastor Raphael, but before he comes up, why don't we go ahead and dismiss the youth uh, and the little ones. So I think we actually have one, uh, Lynn, for the little, little ones. Noah's out there. Thank you. So how many of you guys, oh, all of you should know Zuli. We've, we've talked about her before, so we prayed for her. We support Zuli. We get updates from Zuli. She's a missionary to Spain, Mallorca, Spain. Um, the Lord has used her to um, help start a preschool over in Mallorca. 
And so she was able to get that through the midst of COVID and everything up and running and going. And so the pastor of the church who oversees that is Pastor Rafael. So he came from Mallorca, Spain, and he's going to kind of share what's going on in Spain and with Zuli and with the church over there and how we could pray and how the Lord might use us to help support in any way the Lord leads. So Pastor Rafael, you want to come forward? Good evening. It is the great privilege of our lives to know God, and it is the great privilege of our life to be able to serve him. And not only in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but to the outermost parts of the earth. And we are in Spain. We've been there for 20 years. I met Zuli through Tito in, in, uh, in Cuba, and uh, the Lord knit our hearts together. And, you know, as good as Spain might sound, Spain is the most secular country in Europe. As Catholic as it is, it is much more atheistic. We have a socialist government that is taking more and more um, uh, control of education. And, you know, Hitler said, if you want to win a nation, you teach the kids. You indoctrinate the kids. So we really had it on our hearts to be able to reach the young minds, not to indoctrinate, but to liberate, to be able to share God's love, not to enforce Christianity on them, but to love them. And that's why Zuli came. Zuli, as you all know, is uh, it, it's just an amazing girl. Wherever you go in the world, people love her. In Cuba, they, they just miss her. Uh, right now in Mallorca, she's got close friends. She's gotten involved in every area of ministry. And she is just an amazingly solid, balanced, loving young girl. And she's been nothing but a blessing. She's been nothing but a blessing. And like the pastor said, she, in the midst of COVID, managed to establish a church, uh, a, a school, the preschool. And it was amazing because... You know, there was different forces of saying more people, more kids. And she's like, no, 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 we're not going to take any more kids. And, you know, she's so wise because it helped her. Uh, it helped the school to uh, get a foundation. And you know what? We've heard kids crying because they didn't want to stay home and wanted to go to school. They love the, they love the staff. They love the way the school runs. And it's just been amazing. I'm so grateful that you are here partnering. And you know, when we were doing worship, it was amazing because Jose, Jose, how do you pronounce it? Jose, he played that um, Everbee. And it, you know, we were locked down and Zuli was locked down for three months in, a, in an apartment. And at one point, Jose sent us two sets for Sunday morning. So we were doing everything online. And you know, I just thought it's amazing that this church blessed us while we were quarantined there. It's amazing. And today, it was weird because I didn't even see him. I just heard him sing the first line, and I just turned around. I know that. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing how the Lord ministers to us because not only was that song a, a blessing then, but it's one of my favorite songs when I, from when I first became a Christian. And I am so grateful because I know I talked to Zuli. Zuli's like family. And, uh, and she loves the meetings with you guys, the Zoom meetings. And, the, and, you know, you guys are a great support, and she esteems you highly. She loves it. And I want to say this. I was at the age of 19. I went into the U.S. Army. And one thing you learned, no one's in the front line alone. There's a support team, people that love, people that care, and people that you know you can call upon, and they will send what is needed. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about, you know, just emotionally support, friends, true friends. And, you know, we are in a, it's a privilege. We are in a great mission to rescue, to love on kids, and those kids are being loved. She uh, sent me a list, an uh, uh, email. I'm going to share the prayer requests that I think are, that are on my heart. But um, she sent me, Azuli, 
ways that you guys could get involved with giving towards the school. Uh, ideas that she has was maybe if somebody would like to sponsor children's water supply, 30 euros per month, sponsor a month worth of cleaning products, 50 euros per month, sponsor the catering, 800 euros per month, sponsor a child school month, it's 350 per month, sponsor a jungle gym for the one-year-olds, she didn't put anything next to that, playhouse for toddlers, 500 euros, sponsor a summer sale shade playground, a one-time 300 euros, and on. You know, you, you guys could, could uh, contact Zuli, but, but most of all, I want to ask for the prayer support, because at the end of the day, you can have all these things and actually not do a spiritual work. And I w we have mountains at the moment, which are the, we started the preschool, but we would love to go to first grade and second grade, and the hurdles to do that are immense. And I would like to ask you to commit to prayer. Alan Redpath said, God's past faithfulness demands our present trust. And all the mountains we had to get where we're at are all valleys now. And I would like for you to partner with us in prayer for these mountains to go down. And I want to read a verse because I think this is what you guys are doing. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their way in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his namesake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. And that's what you're doing. In your support to Zuli, you are doing well in the sight of God. May God bless you guys. Thank you. And something else to pray about, too, is Tito and I have been just talking about going to Spain maybe later this year. And just to, uh, what's that? You guys are going? Okay, cool. Um, and so um, pray about, uh, yeah, they already prayed about it. So <laughs> the fastest prayer I ever heard. So, um, yeah, pray about it. If you guys want to join us, um, be a part of that in any way, and we'll get more information as we talked to Pastor Rafael and Zuli in Spain about how we could help and if this year or if we what we do this year and maybe what we do in the following years and just building teams and support. So pray about how the Lord might want to uh, use you in that process. So many opportunities to get involved. So um, never any pressure other than we're just the Lord's servants. So it's up to us to find out what does the Lord want us to do and be faithful to do those things. And so what is it that the Lord's calling you to do? So we just throw out the opportunities, and it's up to you to pray and see what the Lord's telling you to do about them. So with that, let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. What a great place to be for an example of uh, following the leading of the Holy Spirit and what the Lord has us to do. Let's, as you guys do that, let's pray one more time as we prepare for the word. So, Father, we thank you again for this time to gather. We, we love being in your presence, just that ability to worship and exalt you together, to gather together, to encourage, to be encouraged, to be used to minister to other people. Again, as the body, body gathers and gets together, um, you meet your people, Lord. So we thank you for being here. And Lord, I do pray that you would instruct us in your word right now. I pray you'd put your words in my mouth, that, Lord, you would, by your spirit, let them make sense, that you would give us each understanding and teachable hearts, that, that you would be glorified and we would be ministered to, Lord. So do your work right now, we pray. We're in need of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're picking up in verse 38 in chapter 2, repentance and baptism. We'll talk about that next week, 
Just kidding. <laughs> I've told you guys that for the last three weeks. I'm like, I have to share today, otherwise we're going to have a church split. So, and the church will split from me. So we're going to look at verse 38, but in order to understand verse 38, we have to recap what we talked about last week. Last week was Peter's message. So that's uh, without understanding his message, you won't really understand what he means by repent and be baptized. And so we saw that um, Peter gave this message. What prompted it was that it was the day of Pentecost. And so there were pilgrims, crowds, thousands and thousands gathered in the city of Jerusalem from all over the world there to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. And so as this was happening, um, the disciples, 120 of them, were waiting, as Jesus instructed in Jerusalem, for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. And they were waiting, and as they waited, the Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost. And we're not quite sure where they were, in an upper room, but, or they may have been on the Temple Mount. Regardless, they ended up, most likely, on the Temple Mount. Um, and that's where all these crowds heard them speaking their native tongue, the wonderful works of God. And so you kind of picture yourself if you were a pilgrim traveling from some of the, the places here, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, uh, from Pergia and Pamphylia and Egypt. If you were from Pamphylia and then all of a sudden you heard this noise and these people saying things, but then you discerned your own tongue, your home native language, and somebody worshiping God in the Pamphylian language, it, it would draw you, and you were probably there with some of your friends that you traveled with, like, hey, I hear some of our countrymen uh, praising God. Let's go see what's going on. And then some Egyptians and some Parthenians. And so by the time it was done, there were over 3,000 people gathered from these 120 that were speaking various languages, and they were praising God. And so them praising God drew these pilgrims from all over, and some of them mockingly said, oh, they're drunk, and others sincerely inquired, what could this mean? And so Peter stood with authority, and he told them what this means, what they were hearing, and how it came to be. And so in the message, he quotes three scriptures. The first one was Joel chapter 2. And he says, what's happening, what you're seeing is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. And Joel chapter 2 started the last days. The last days we talked about last week was really started with the first coming of Jesus and will end with the second coming of Jesus. And so whenever you hear somebody say like, the last days, the la my grandma told me it was, yeah, your grandma was right. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. The last days, meaning that era, which is the messianic era, the kingdom that Christ came to establish. It started with the first coming. So then he goes on after he quotes Joel 2, and a lot is covered in that Joel 2 passage. There will be the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. And we looked how it, wasn't, um, it didn't discern between man and woman. Uh, social class was not a distinction, bond servants and maid servants. And it also wasn't, age wasn't a restriction, old men and young men alike. So everyone received the Holy Spirit. Unlike the Old Testament, where only some received it for a certain work, for a certain purpose, like kings and priests and judges, the future promise from the Old Testament was one day every believer will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and now they were witnessing the fulfillment of that promise. And so this, Peter went on to say, was initiated. This was made possible by Jesus Christ. And that's the rest of the message where he talks about how Jesus initiated this. And Jesus proved himself to be the Messiah, who was therefore able to initi initiate Joel 2 and the end times, by one, performing signs and miracles. Joel prophesied that signs and wonders would be done. And Peter points back to that and says, you know very well that Jesus performed signs and wonders. It was well known. Then the second thing was he raised from the dead. And he quoted Psalm 16. He said, Psalm 16 prophesied that the Messiah would rise from the dead. Jesus did that. And the 120 that are speaking these languages can bear witness. We can testify that we saw the risen Jesus. And thirdly, he proved that he was the Messiah by ascending to the Father, which again, he quoted Psalm 110 and said it was prophesied that the Messiah would ascend to the Father. And he says this was proved by sending the promise of the Holy Spirit, which you now are witnesses of. You saw us receive the promise of Joel 2, speak in tongues and prophesy in the Spirit, 
And so you now are testifying to the fact that Jesus ascended to the Father. So he brought it full circle, that Jesus initiated it, the fulfillment of Joel 2, the coming of the Spirit. He was able to do this because he was the Messiah, because he rose from the dead, he ascended to the Father and sent the Holy Spirit, which you're witnessing here. So this was the logic of his, of his message. The crowds then recognized that they had missed the Messiah, that Jesus came, and they did not recognize him, and it would appear from Peter's message that they bore some responsibility for his rejection. Peter told them in verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, he says, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. And then again in verse 36, he says, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so he put the blame on them. And there was this awareness, the last days have begun because the Messiah came. And when the last days came, there was an expectation that they could conclude at any moment. And so they were living in the last days because the Messiah came. We didn't recognize him, and we actually rejected him. And so the logical thought is once they came to this conclusion was, what do we do? And that's verse 37. That's their response to Peter's message was now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, if we were in their shoes, I think I'd freak out a little bit. Oh, my gosh. We missed the Messiah. Is it too late? You know, what should we do? And so I'm sure there was a lot of passion, sincerity in this question of what shall we do? Is it too late for us? And now Peter responds to their inquiry, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Now, aren't you glad he didn't say, sorry, it's too late, right? You missed him, you rejected him, and now it's too late. And so you guys are hopeless. Aren't you glad God is gracious and patient and loving? I can't tell you how many times I was convicted before I received Jesus Christ, how many church services I sat through, how many battles I fought and resisted the Lord calling me and stirring me and making me aware that I needed Jesus. And I'm so thankful that he never said, sorry, it's too late. He kept humbling himself, really, by pursuing me, even though I was hard and rejecting. And so God continues to do that. I also can't tell you how many times since I've received Jesus, I'm glad he's not said those words to me. How many times I've failed, I've made mistakes, I've messed up, and the word is always the same. The same response is repent, and essentially we're going to explain what that means is turn back to the Lord. And so those words are always available for us. So thank God for his patience and grace. But he tells them to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And two things are going to happen. You're going to receive forgiveness, the remission of sins, and you're going to receive what you're witnessing. You're going to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2 will be a reality in your life. So what a wonderful promise. What a wonderful declaration. But isn't that an interesting way for Peter to respond, is repent and be baptized, especially after we kind of look at the rest of the New Testament, wouldn't it seem like a better response would be believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved? That's what Paul says a little bit later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, remember the Philippian jailer, what should we do? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household shall be saved. And we look at the rest of the New Testament, it seems it's a belief in Jesus, a faith in him. Why does Peter, in this first message, say, repent and be baptized? If someone were to even ask you today, you know, what should I do? The Lord's been convicting me. What should I do to be saved? What would you tell them? Would it be probably share the gospel like Peter did and say, believe in Jesus, receive him as your Lord and Savior. I don't think we would word it in the way of repent and be baptized. I don't know if we would word it that way. So why does Peter word it that way? And what does that mean for us? Are we doing it wrong or thinking of it in a different way? But really, we're going to see that these two things together really describe true faith. 
It's, it's really saying the same thing. It's really saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He's just saying it in a different way, maybe a way that we're not used to hearing it. So many people say they believe, but it's more of a mental understanding as opposed to a true commitment. Don't you hear a lot of people say, like, I believe in Jesus, but there seems to be a real lack of the type of faith that the Bible describes, a real adherence, a commitment, a full surrender to the Lord. And really, these two terms explain that full commitment and surrender in a different way. But it's still the same concept scripturally of a deep faith or commitment to the Lord Jesus. So let's start with repentance. Repentance, isn't that an interesting word? When I hear repentance, I think of stop sinning, right? When somebody says repent, I typically think stop sinning. And that never sat right with me because repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what hit my head is stop sinning and believe in Jesus. To me, that's backwards. I can't stop sinning until I believe in Jesus, right? I tried. I tried for years. I was hooked on drugs and alcohol, and I tried stopping those things, and I could not until I received Jesus. It also makes it sound very works-oriented, doesn't it? It's like clean your life up first and believe in Jesus. That order seems backwards to me, and, I, and as I looked into that, I'm like, because I, repentance, I think, means a little bit different. The emphasis of repentance, I think, is a little bit different than we might be used to hearing when we hear repent or turn from sin. So the Greek word is metanoeo. I probably terribly ruined that word, but metanoeo. And it really means to change your mind or change your will. So the question is, what are they being asked to change their mind about? Again, often the emphasis is what you need to stop doing when you hear the word repent. But I think the scripture, even though that's included, definitely we're talking about changing behavior. But usually the emphasis, it seems like in scripture, when the term repentance is used, is really what you're turning to, not what you're turning from. And that's a big difference. That might sound like semantics, but it has huge implications. And I think a whole attitude of our perspective of who God is and our relationship to our behavior and our sins. I'll give you an illustration. Let's just say I'm staring out the window. And Scott over here, this is Scott. Say hi, Scott. So Scott's back there, and Scott wants me to look at him. He wants to show me something. And so Scott can do that. The most efficient way is if Scott said, hey, Jason, can you look at me? And then as I turned, I'd look at Scott. And by nature, I'm not looking at the window anymore, right? Because I turned and looked at Scott, I'm not looking out the window anymore. Now, let's just say Scott worded it different. Let's just say Scott focused on what he wanted me to stop doing. And let's just say Scott said, hey, Jason, stop looking out the window. Okay, I could end up all kinds of places. I could end up there. I could end up over there. I could end up back here. And so it's less specific if I'm just focused on what I'm not to do. But if I focus on what I'm supposed to do, by very nature, I won't do what I'm not supposed to do. And that's the focus, really, of Scripture when, when it's related to our behavior and when the word repentance is used, is really the emphasis is on what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not to do will come as a result of that. So let's go back here. What is this audience in Acts chapter 2 being told to repent to? The context of the message is clear. I already shared it with you. Jesus, he ended with this. His message wrapped up. His very last words was, all these things prove that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. That's what he left them with. And we see the, 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 what the, he put on them was that they rejected that. They did not recognize that at first, and they rejected that, and they seemed to bear some responsibility for that rejection and crucifixion as he put that responsibility on them. So he's telling them, you need to change your mind about who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. You did not recognize him. You rejected him. You need to change your mind about that. You need to see him for who he is, and you need to believe in him and embrace him. When we look at those two words and what they mean, they're being asked to do a lot more than an intellectual acknowledgement of Jesus. So saying like, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. A lot of people say that. A lot of people believe there is a Jesus, that Jesus did exist, that there is a God, 
But again, there seems to be this lack of intense commitment or relationship with him, which typically leads to a change in our behavior and in our lifestyle. But again, these two things, it's a full trusting, again, that he's Lord. These aren't light words. Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? He's master. He's king. He's ruler. When someone is your master, what do you do? You follow them. They're your leader. That's not a light word to use. He is their Lord. And he's your savior. Your only hope of salvation. Your only access into heaven. The only thing that's going to get you out of hell and punishment is Jesus. So you put those things together. That's not just, yeah, I believe he's out there. No, I have to cling to that. I have to understand that these are powerful words that describe the type of relationship and the way that I should view Jesus. Now, does this involve a change in behavior? Of course, right? Based on what I believe will affect the things I do. And so as I repent and turn to Christ, I'll repent from doing the things that are opposite of Jesus. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 8, he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's interesting, isn't it? Is whatever repentance is, there's action that goes along with it. Repentance isn't necessarily physical action, but it results in action. He says, if you change your mind about God, then bear fruit in keeping with that change of attitude. If you embrace God, trust God, and turn to Jesus, then bear fruit in keeping with that decision. What you believe, again, affects your behavior. There's a saying, a fancy saying, orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. Orthodoxy means right doctrine. Orthopraxy means right practice. So right doctrine leads to right practice. What you believe will affect your behavior and how you live your life. That's always a sign, and that's the message in Scripture. We could say all we want about God and what we think of God, but how you live your life will show really what you believe and trust and place your faith in. And so the rubber meets the road in our practice. Here's a thought for us. Here's the message. One day I'm living for myself. I'm the Lord of my life. And my behavior corresponds to my belief. It corresponds to where my mind is and where I'm facing. I do what seems right to me. I do what, I do what, seem, what feels good, what works, what's expedient. I could lie. I could get drunk. I could trash people, I could gossip, I could backbite. Whatever's efficient and feels good for my master, who's me. Then I hear the gospel, and I hear there's a God who loves me. I hear there's a God I'm accountable to who will judge me. I hear there's a God who died for me and rose from the dead to prove that. I, I hear there's a God who's coming back that my life's going to be accountable to, and he's going to judge me. And I turn to him as my Lord and my Savior. I, I recognize that he's my path to forgiveness, to restoration of relationship with the God of the universe, uh, and I turn to that. Then my behavior should change as a result of that. Where I'm facing, where I'm trusting, where my faith is will then dictate the behavior and how I live my life. Jesus is my Lord and my master now, so who is he? He speaks truth. He's love. He's patient. He's kind. He's pure. And so now I, following him as my Lord and master, my behavior should correspond to that. The good thing is we learn a lot that not only when I place my faith in him, a lot happens. I'm freed from the penalty of sin. I'm forgiven. I'm also free from the power of sin. I'm also filled with his Holy Spirit and empowered now to be changed and follow his example and live the life that he calls me to do. And so now I'm, my behavior is corresponding to where I'm placing my faith and my trust. This also applies to our continued walk with the Lord. I think sometimes as believers, we can get a little stuck in our walk with the Lord, and we can get a little too focused on what we shouldn't be doing, on the things we're supposed to stop doing. And that makes the walk with the Lord kind of burdensome. It makes it kind of dry. Our focus always in Scripture is always just look to the Lord. Always just look to the Lord. Spend time with him worship him, be in love with him, and then just do what he tells me to do, right? Follow his instructions and what he's saying. In scripture, there's all these lists. We call them the put-offs and the put-ons. The things we're supposed to start doing now as believers, as children of God, and the things we're supposed to put off. Things like, don't lie anymore, but speak truth with one another. Uh, don't steal, but labor with your hands that you might be able to give to those that are in need. 
And so we could focus on the don'ts. Don't lie. Don't steal. Um, don't do these things. But if I focus again on what I'm supposed to do, I automatically won't do what I'm not supposed to. And I'm much more accurate in doing what I'm supposed to do. For example, if I focus on just not lying, I might not ever fully tell the truth. There's a difference between the two. There's a difference between not lying and actively speaking truth. But if I just focus on, I want to be truthful. Jesus is truth. He's the way, the truth, the life. He says the mark of maturity in Ephesians is to speak the truth in love. I want to be a truthful, honest person. I'm going to set my mind intentionally about speaking truth, speaking truth. Then guess what the last thing in my mind is? I don't want to lie. I'm not going to lie, right? I automatically won't do what I'm not supposed to if I just focus on doing what the Lord wants me to do. And so there's a big difference in the focus that we have with that. The next thing is be baptized. Repent, turn to change your mind about Jesus. See he's Lord, he's master, he's savior. Turn your, your, your heart to him. And the next thing is to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. This is really just a continued thought from what repentance is, is a full adherence or trust in the Lord. So what is baptism? We've talked about this recently as well. Water baptism is really just a sign of association, a full commitment to. It's an outward sign of associating, especially back in these days with someone's teaching or doctrine. And really, in the Jewish mind, baptism was really only for the Gentiles to convert to Judaism. But here they're being asked to be baptized, and specifically in the name of Jesus. They had to show identification publicly with who Jesus was. To a publicly identify with him as Lord and Savior, as verse 36 says. Now this had to come as a result of an understanding of who Jesus was, that Peter just taught, a true and deep faith and repentance towards him as Savior. Otherwise, they would not be publicly baptized here in especially Jerusalem. Here's a quote from John Stott. He says, to be baptized for them meant that you were aligning yourself with his authority, acknowledging his claims, subscribing to his doctrines, engaging in his service, and relying on his merits. And so it, when you publicly were baptized, you were fully associating with who Jesus was. And so it took faith to do that. So we see here that these two put together really define what true faith in Christ looks like. So that brings up a good question. Do we need to be baptized for the remission of sins, right? The way this is worded here, it says, be baptized, repent, and be baptized for the remission of sins. The way that's worded, it sounds like we need to be baptized in order to be forgiven. And if this were the only scripture in the Bible that dealt with baptism and forgiveness of sins, then I would say, man, we better be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It seems like that's necessary. But we have a ton of scripture that seems to say something else, that's, that seem to say that baptism is not part of salvation. Let me read a few of them. Later on in the book of Acts, Acts 16.31, which I quoted earlier, the Philippian jailer, uh, when he asked, what must we do to be saved? Paul answered and says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing about baptism. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. In the very next chapter, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, again, Peter giving this declaration, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Nothing about baptism is included there. The Bible goes on to teach specifically what saves us. Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And the gospel is clearly laid out through scripture. Peter just taught it. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the common thread of whenever the, the gospel is presented in the book of Acts, that's the three things that are given. If you go to 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there now, make note of that, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it's clearly laid out. Those are the three elements. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the gospel. And Romans says that is the power of God to salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul even specifies a distinction between baptism and salvation. In verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. So if baptism was necessary for salvation, 
Paul wouldn't say, like, man, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. You're all going to hell. I didn't baptize any of you, right? He wouldn't brag or boast about that. And then in verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And so, again, we put that together. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. The gospel, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And there's a distinction, Paul says, between baptism and the gospel. So it's clear that the go- that baptism is not part or necessary for salvation. Then we see other verses like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works. And so we see that we're only saved by the grace of God and that we pay- place faith in the work of Jesus Christ. So baptism, again, is very important. As I said a moment ago, it was a demonstration of true repentance about Jesus and placing their faith in him as the Messiah. So as they repented and changed their mind from rejecting, not recognizing and rejecting the Lord, to now receiving and embracing him, now they would publicly declare that through baptism. We talked about that as well when we looked at the Great Commission in in the end of Matthew, chapter 28, is what was going and making disciples, but to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey all that I commanded. So we talked about baptism was so closely related to salvation because it was the first act they would do after placing faith in Christ. Because being publicly associated with Jesus required faith because it came at great cost. Once you made a public stand for Jesus, many times you were ostracized, from your community, you would lose your job, your source of income, you would face physical persecution. So you could believe all you want, but eventually, if you truly believed in Jesus, that had to come out, and that was typically immediately demonstrated through public baptism to where you would identify publicly in your community that you would receive Jesus as your Savior. And so that's how those are tied together. So again, baptism, an outward sign of a sincere faith and That was demonstrated through baptism, and that's the place of it through the rest of the New Testament. Again, important, but not necessary. And for us as well, if you haven't been baptized, it's something for you to do. It's commanded in Scripture, and so it's a public declaration. It doesn't carry the same consequences and significance back as it did back back here socially, but it does for the Lord. He asks us to do it, and so we should. I have known many people through the years who put it off because they just said, like, well, no, I want to wait till it's right for me. I'm like, well, don't forget that. Do it. Jesus said, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. If you understand it or not, wait for the understanding to come, but just follow the Lord in obedience to him, whatever he asks you to do. And so one of those is baptism. And so if you haven't been baptized uh, we're actually going to have one at the end of summer here in a, in a month or so. So we'll give you updates on when that is. And so if you want to be baptized, we'll give you that opportunity to do so. But interesting here, too, then what about the language here? How do you read this then? It says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Doesn't that sound like you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins? But the wording actually supports this here. That word for be baptized for the remission of sins. The word in the Greek is the same as it is in English. Let me give you two examples. I'm going to go to the store for some aspirin. I'm going to the store, what? To obtain aspirin, right? And so that's how it's used. Now let me use it in another sentence. I'm going to take aspirin for a headache. Now am I going to take aspirin to obtain a headache? Am I trying to get a headache? I mean, I, I, need a, I haven't had a headache in a while. I'm going to take some aspirin and so I can get a headache. I'm not taking aspirin for a headache. I'm taking it because I have a headache. The word for is used that way, either to obtain or as a result of. And that's the same way in the Greek here. So you could read this sentence one of two ways. Be baptized to obtain remission of sins or be baptized because you've obtained remission of sins. And so that's based on the rest of scripture and even the content of Peter's message. It's clear it's the latter. Be baptized, so repent, turn to Jesus, and then be baptized because you have remission of sins is how that sentence really reads, and we can read it in the Greek. So again, if there's true faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we're forgiven and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that many times. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, truly believe in him, the Bible says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. What a wonderful promise. 
again, we, we can't overemphasize that. We take that for granted so much of the time. But this, the era we live in, the, the previous people in the covenant relationship with God long for this experience that we have. They long that they would be able to have the Holy Spirit come upon them. Again, only some people for certain tasks got that blessing in the Old Testament. Now all that receive Jesus receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that's something to examine ourselves. Are we enjoying that? Are we taking full advantage? Because it came at a high price. Christ had to go to the cross to forgive us of our sins so thoroughly that the God of the universe can now come and live within us. And so that's the, the cost. And so are we enjoying that? Are we experiencing the Holy Spirit, surrendering to him, allowing him to mold us, to shape us, to minister through us, to minister to other people? And so that should be a constant, ongoing thing and a great blessing that we are promised and can take advantage of. So finally here, verse 39 and 40. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. A few things here. First, the promise of the Holy Spirit is to those who are close and far off. This is to us, to all that will believe. And so that's comforting to know we're not an afterthought. We're not a result of what happened 2,000 years ago, just collateral damage. God always had us in mind, and his heart was always a promise to us that if we call out to the Lord, we will be saved, and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We see, too, that this message is probably much longer than what was written here. We touched on that last week. A lot of these messages in the book of Acts are just a synopsis, a summing up of the entire message, which was probably much longer the different messages in the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit preserved what we needed to have through the, through the ages, highlights of the messages that he gave through the book of Acts, through Peter and Paul and the different apostles. But we see here that he persuaded them with many other words. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't half-hearted. He, he really persuaded and tried to convince them. That's how we need to be, too. We have to be patient. We can't be lazy and half-hearted. We really have to care that people understand or don't understand. If there's hindrances or things that don't make sense to them, that we take the time, answer questions, get to know what their hang-ups or concerns are, or problems, that we can help them understand and persuade them with truth. We're not salesmen trying to put a shine on a half-hearted project. I've, I've never wanted to do sales. I'm, I don't know how good of a salesperson I'd ever be. Uh, I don't like to persuade people to do things. But I think sales is all about the product you got, right? I think some people just like the, the talking and persuading thing. Uh, most, I don't know, don't think they do. But when you got a good product, I always thought, man, if I had a product that, like, if I put this on your sink, it'll turn your water to gold. <laughs> I'd be a salesman all day, right? I mean, that, that product sells itself. I would just go to your house, hey, put this on. That's what the gospel is. I mean, we have truth that radically changes people's lives now and for eternity. That should stir us like, man, I, I, I don't have to put a shine on this. Let me just tell you, God loves you, died for you, and paid your way to go to heaven and wants to fill you with his spirit, give you hope and peace and comfort and joy now. Do you want that, right? That's, let me just tell you the truth about this product, and let me persuade you with anything that might hinder you from, some, from seeing or experiencing that. Then he goes on to say, he, as he's persuading them to be saved from this perverse generation. Now, this was a generation that witnessed Jesus personally. They saw him perform signs and wonders. He declared and proved himself to be the Messiah and the Savior by his teachings and his wonders. He fulfilled the prophetic word, and they rejected him. This might have been the most perverse generation Ever. We always think we live in the worst generation, the most perverse, but this is the one that saw the word of God embodied, fully revealed, and they rejected and crucified him. That's a perverse generation. But did Peter say, I'm done with you guys. I write you off. No, he bore with them. He persuaded them. He was calling them out of this perverse generation. We could apply that same thing to us now. We have to be really careful that we don't become critical of the generation that we live in, the people that are trapped in it. We have to feel sorry for them. You know, sometimes you want to throw something at your TV, like, oh, man, what's wrong with you? What a dumb thing. What a new legislation or a new this or that. 
We should have pity. They're trapped. In, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving. We should have pity on them. We should pray for them, and we should be uh, having a heart to persuade them, come out of this perversion, come out of this perverse generation, and come to the truth because you will receive forgiveness and healing and a better quality of life. And that's where uh, Peter had his heart right here. Finally, verse 41, and we'll close. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. What a great response. And again, I can't help but think of Peter just having his mind blowed. We talked about that last week. When he was given this message and saying, you know, you crucified the Lord, you rejected him by lawless hands, I think in the back of his mind he was thinking, we're dead. We're dead, right? Because... Fifty days earlier, Jesus entered Jerusalem and gave the same message to the religious leaders. And within three days, he was beaten, crucified, and killed. And so if that happened to Jesus, they had to be thinking like, yeah, we're dead too. But you sense more was happening than just the Holy Spirit in them. But now the Holy Spirit in Acts was coming to, I mean, sorry, and, and as John and Jesus said in John, to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now the Holy Spirit was on them making them sensitive and receptive to what he was sharing through Peter. And so again, we just have to be obedient and do what the Lord calls us to do. And now here, what a great response. 3,000 people were added to the kingdom of God and were baptized right there. And a lot of people um, kind of like, how could that happen? Right, the, right there on the Temple Mount. But I was reading another commentator, and he was just saying that um, there were all kinds of cisterns in that area for this purpose for water retention for the purpose of, of water immersion through different practices in Judaism. And so they have discovered over 150 immersion pools in the city of Jerusalem. And m many of them have eight to 12,000 cubic meters of water that they could hold. And so there was mass accumulations of water for the purpose of public water immersion. So they could have easily done that in a matter of hours, that amount of people, that 3,000. So what a great testimony that was, and what a change in boldness that now Peter had from rejecting and running from the Lord, denying him, from hiding and living in timidity for the last 50 days, to now standing up and demanding they all listen, sharing the gospel, probably expecting to be killed, and now 3,000 people respond. And that's the same opportunity we each have as we follow the Lord, are faithful to him, and wait for the opportunities. As we said earlier Man, there's just those times. We're, we're going to see the in-between times, but do we walk around saying, God, what crazy thing do you want to do today? Holy Spirit, who do you want to share with? Who do you want to talk to? Maybe it's a brother or sister you want to pray, encourage, or exhort, or maybe it's a person you never expect. It's their day for salvation. The Lord wants to use you to start a conversation, and, and he, he's going to put words in your mouth that will blow your mind. And you might think, I'm dead. Maybe socially, I'm dead. This guy's going to burn me. He's going to uh, humiliate me. He's going to ask me a question I have no idea how to answer. But you may be amazed when he says, man, what should I do to be saved? You know, And then you have the opportunity to lead him to the Lord. And so we all, we all have that. So we want to be praying about how God wants to use. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your love. And Lord, uh, we thank you for the great promise that you've given to us. The first thing, Lord, as we just see this, what is our attitude towards you? What is our belief, our trust? Do we see you as Lord, Master, King of our lives? Do we see you as our only hope of deliverance from sin and self and hell? Do we see you as our salvation to heaven and to a relationship with the loving God of the universe? Lord, I pray that everyone in here, if they don't know you as that, that even right now, they would call out to you. They would repent and turn to you as their Lord, their Master, and their Savior. And for the rest of us, Lord, that we would examine what we believe about you. Are you really those things, or were you? Were you that at one time in our life, but now you're not so much our Master and Commander of every decision, our Savior and Deliverer? So, Lord, that we would be challenged to maybe fresh and new turn back to you and completely put you as the ruler of our lives and the deliverer of our souls, Lord. And so, Lord, I do, do just pray that you would let these things sink in in our hearts, Lord, 
And also, if we have received that, then we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that each person in here would be experiencing that walk with you, that ministry with you. And I pray, Lord, anyone in here that's maybe heartbroken, confused, or hurt, that, Lord, they would experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Those that are confused and need direction and wisdom, that they would experience the leading, the guiding, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Those that are crushed and downcast would receive the lifting up of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, whatever it is that we need, the God of the universe is living within us, that we would turn and surrender and ask you to be what's lacking, what is needed. Maybe even show us what we don't even see is lacking and needed, Lord. We just pray that you would feel free to move and minister, even as we respond to this message and these truths through worship, that, Lord, you would speak and minister to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand and meditate on these things as we sing this last song. A lot of times I think we're checked out during the last song, thinking about what we're going to do, but really let the Lord speak to you about whatever it is he just reveal to you. Meditate on those verses and those words and see what it is the Lord might want to do specifically for you. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never 
God bless you guys. Have an awesome rest of your Sunday. God bless. Have a good night.